Good afternoon. We're going to spend a few moments discussing some of the themes of uh, Professor Irena Bacchus's uh, paper, which is entitled Heterodoxy, Church History, and Biblical Exegesis in Newton's General Scolium. Uh, Irena Bacchus at the Institute of the History of Reformation at the University of Geneva. Unfortunately, she has a very important uh, thing that she has to do at her home institution, so she is not able to be with us in person, but she assures us that uh, she is with us in spirit. And uh, I did ask her to send a little update on her work, on her paper, which uh, I'll read now. Let me begin by saying how grateful I am to Steve, Stefan, and Scott for inviting me to participate in this symposium. I am especially grateful to Steve who has provided me with numerous Newton resources and who has been an excellent conversation partner, uh, valiantly bearing my emails and questions over the past months. I am therefore all the more sorry not to be able to be with you today and to hear your reactions, all of which uh, to my you, a view to my still tentative hypothesis. Unfortunately, this event coincided with another previous academic engagement at my own university. I am I very much hope to get your feedback on the abstract I sent and any further reflections you consider opposite and appropriate. Since writing the abstract, I have done some further work on Newton and the Trinity, and have reached the conclusion that he was not a Socinian, which I think is no novelty to any of you. To be a Socinian, he would have had to argue for the humanity of Christ, something he does not do. This would have meant restricting God's power with respect to his salvific work. I have therefore investigated somewhat Newton's concept of filiation and have come to the conclusion that this is a key issue that must be addressed before we reach any conclusions about the specificity of Newton's anti-Trinitarianism. Given Newton's statement about God in draft B of the general scolium, where he is rather less abstract than in the final draft, I find myself asking the question of what sort of being such a God could engender. Obviously not one that would be merely human. The reference to John 10 and 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, suggests that he could and did engender a son, but that the Son, while having a vital role to play in salvation, does not share in God's substance, as Newton's notes on the homoousios make clear. The early modern exegesis of John 10, verse 35, insists on the fact that Jesus here is drawing a dividing line between himself and the Father on the one hand and humans on the other. Newton implies in the general scolium that the dividing line to be drawn is between the Father and the Son. Humans come some way behind. However, matters get more complicated when we look at Newton's scattered and very brief notes on Trinity and filiation among his mint papers and also in Cambridge University Library Additional Manuscript 3965, Folio 664, Recto. Newton talks here about the father who by allegory is said to beget sons in his own shape or image, not in the carnal, but in the spiritual sense of the term. The notes in the Cambridge University Library manuscript contains a larger number of biblical references than the excerpt in the Mint Papers. The references all concern the statement that the father begets sons. The verses concerned are, Job 28, verse 7, Luke 3, verse 38, Genesis 2, verse 7, Acts 17, verses 25 and 29, Colossians 1, verse 18, the Apocalypse 1, verse 5. Now, if we examine these in detail, we see that the Son in, for example, Apocalypse 1, verse 5, is considered as superior to men and inferior to the Father, the firstborn of the dead while others, for example, Genesis 2, verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and man became a living person, would suggest that God was created just like all men were. There is obviously some 
an ambivalence to Newton's concept of filiation, and I believe that some light on this could be thrown if his use of the Bible and biblical references were to be examined further. So we're grateful to Professor uh, Bacchus for providing us with that pricey of uh, her work uh, as it is uh, to date. Now, I have a couple of handouts, and um, Hannah, I'm wondering whether you could uh, pass these around for us. Keeping one for myself. So there is one that is a uh, single sheet, uh, two-sided, and then this one right here. Now, um, these two handouts are actually available on the uh, Newton Project Canada website, isaacnewton.ca. Some of you may have seen them already. Uh, the first one lists the references and prints out the passages that are cited in the two editions of Newton's General Scolium, 1713 and 1726. Uh, the other, uh, much longer document, lists the verses that are cited in the drafts, uh, the, the formal drafts, drafts A to E, and also the scattered fragmentary drafts that we find in the Cambridge University Library papers and the uh, Mint papers. You'll notice that the verses that appear in the print edition of the General Scolium uh, appear in the draft material, but there are also additional verses that appear in the draft material. Now this relates to some of the work that uh, Stefan Duchesne is doing and uh, also some work that has been done in the past looking at the theological themes of the uh, general scolium. So you'll notice that there is a section on <coughs> scriptural passages in the note on the generation of sons, filiation, that's on the longer of the two handouts on page seven. And you'll see that the theme here is sonship. So in the case of Job 38, and again, this is the longer stapled handout, page seven, the very top there, Job 38, the underlined portion, verse seven, uh, gives us uh, the verse that Newton actually cites. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Who are the sons of God? Traditionally, these would be uh, the angels. They're called sons of God, but clearly they're not God, very God, etc. Uh, the next example is Adam, who's called the son of God. Uh, and then you have the description of Adam being created in Genesis 2, uh, verse 5. And then the case in Acts 17 uh, refers to human beings as the offspring of God, and that is in the second underlined uh, portion there. The italicized portion of that passage uh, made it into the published edition of the uh, General Scolium. And then we have uh, two additional uh, scriptural passages, Colossians 1 verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And then also from Revelation 1 and verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So those two passages obviously go together. Christ as the first begotten, uh, in this case, first begotten of the dead, first begotten of the, the new creation that the Apostle Paul uh, speaks about. So this is uh, one of the insights that uh, Professor Bacchus has, that there is actually lying behind the published text of the General Scolium uh, a concern for divine aff affiliation, uh, the generation of sons, and clearly Newton is trying to situate uh, uh, Christ uh, in the various passages that speak about um, uh, divine uh, sonship. And the reading of, of these, this cluster of verses uh, does, uh, I think, more than suggest uh, certainly a non-Trinitarian uh, sense. The big question is just who is Christ uh, for a Newton? So Professor Bacchus has ruled out a strictly uh, Socinian uh, interpretation, 
of Christ. That is to say that Jesus uh, is, is a man, although the Socinians didn't believe that he was a mere man. They, they did believe that he was literally the Son of God as well. There's some variation depending on which Socinian author you, uh, you deal with. So this just gives us a sense of uh, what help we can get from looking at the uh, manuscript drafts. So this is one of the manuscript drafts in the series ADE. Uh, and here's another one from the University Library of Cambridge papers. And you can see the reference to Job there, Luke 3. So these are, these are the, uh, the passages that we just looked at that refer to the filiation. Um, and uh, this one as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's been transcribed yet, no. Yeah, uh, <coughs> Stefan Duchesne is working on this, yeah. And uh, here's another one. This is one I, I referred to earlier, and, it, and it, it has the passage about immortal souls and, and how uh, Newton seems to be saying that, he seems to be arguing against the, the idea that souls are, are naturally immortal and, and that the afterlife is entirely dependent on God's uh, sovereignty and, and dominion. And, it seems that Newton was a mortalist of some kind. Uh, what, what's not clear is what kind of mortalist. So we have a few minutes to discuss some of these things, but I thought it would be useful to look at those verses, and this gives you a sense of what uh, Dr. Bacchus is doing and uh, the rich resource we have in those uh, manuscript drafts. And although Newton doesn't provide a lot of commentary about the meaning of those verses as he sees them, their juxtaposition with each other uh, is, I think, more than suggestive of the sense that he's taking from them. Any thoughts about any of this? Yes, you do. <laughs> It's, um, um, can, can, sorry, Eric, can you just restate yeah, that? Yes, so I have a question about Job 38, and I was just wondering what the early modern commentary on it is, because here it looks like uh, creation, um, um, well, that the creation of the stars really precedes um, either the creation of the Earth or um, that they're already around regardless of creation, uh, so that they're on creation. So uh, J Job is a complicated text in the Jewish tradition mm -hmm. for reasons like this, uh, but it strikes me that if you're interested in cosmogony and cosmology, um, this is also complicating. Uh, so there, I agree there's this filiation issue, mm -hmm. but there's connected to that um, all kinds of further heresies lurking in these texts. So I was just wondering to what degree there was a separate tradition domesticating Job so that it comes out appropriate. Well, are, are you referring to this particular passage? That yeah, this passage basically yeah. says, when I created the earth, the stars were around. Um, and that's a much more, <laughs> there's a sense in well. which that connects up with platonic views, mm -hmm. but um, I don't think, I, well, there's I, a complicated history of how to understand the origin of Job yeah. in Hellenistic thought, but um, well, I, it doesn't Eric, fit well with the seven days or even. Okay, I, I, I think maybe the text is open to, to that kind of reading. Um, the way I read it is I take those two lines, the two lines that are underlined, as being parallel. So the morning stars are the sons of God. This is a classic move and mm -hmm. that's, that's, um, I, th I think probably they're morning stars in some kind of metaphorical uh, way. Um, so the idea, and this, this is a, an idea that you see in, Christ in the Christian tradition as well, is that yes, the Genesis account of creation describes God and there aren't any direct references to angels, but that this text would imply that the angels were part of the, the creative process.
Well, I, I, I think, you know, he's using this to, to show that angels are called sons of God, right? But they're not God. They're not God, very God. Um, I don't know whether either of our two uh, experts in early modern biblical exegesis might want to add to that. And if they do, I, I really hope they go up to the, the microphone. <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, although the parallelism is not necessarily one that an early modern scholar would make, um, I think your sense that, that most people would read this if they were presenting an orthodox reading uh, in the early modern period as relating to angels or some form of um, being not adequately described in Genesis and possibly um, part of something other than the creation of the world which is described there is probably correct. Um, I'm more interested in a slightly different question, which is what are these scriptural citations doing in Newton's text? They're not, Newton isn't writing a commentary on these verses of scripture. He's using these verses of scripture and in the end making quite close selections from them, really to provide proof texts for what he's otherwise saying. So actually, in a curious kind of way, it isn't surprising if he appears to be pulling them apart because I don't think he's, well, something has gone on in the process of the composition of this text where the biblical texts have been brought in. But in no case of the draft does it appear to be, the, as far as I can remember, is it, does he start from the biblical text? The biblical text is always added to the metaphysical argument that he's presenting. Um, now, that's actually exactly the use of scripture that Newton's more learned theological contemporaries condemn. It's precisely you know, concordance searching, commonplace book searching to find texts that appear to say what you want to say anyway because of your theological, the theological position that you've adopted not from your reading of the Bible, but that you're bringing to your reading of the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that's the way, it's certainly not the way that Newton works on all the occasions that he writes theology, far from it. A good deal of his theological writing is indeed biblical commentary. But in this case, um, I think it probably is much closer to that method and it's also interesting in that context to bear in mind that the vast majority of these references, not quite all of them, but the vast majority of them, the one King's reference is a clear um, exception, no one or two others, um, these are not texts that Newton ever incorporated into the main part of his theological writing or based his the main part of his theological writing on. So these look to me rather strange as uh, biblical texts as used by Newton. Well, quite fortunately, uh, Professor Bacchus um, works in the field of early modern uh, exegesis and biblical interpretation, so I think she's quite well placed to handle some of these uh, questions. But she, does, she has raised, and it's uh, an important one, this whole issue of uh, affiliation. And, uh, like to wrap up this session, because we do need to move on, but I, I do remember having a discussion with the late historian of science, uh, Roger Han, after uh, giving a paper about the general scolium, and he came up to me and he said, did, did you notice that Christ isn't mentioned in the general scolium? <laughs> and uh, I think his point was, is that the text is kind of a deistic, kind of looks like a deistic text, and, and I said, well, you know, John 10 is a quotation <coughs> from Christ, uh, so we've got to start there, but when you start to look at the the uh, draft material, uh, you do see more 
uh, more evidence that Christ is sort of lurking in, in the background. And I think he certainly is part of the argument about what the, the name God means, right? Because again, this is a big issue for a Trinitarian. Uh, when Christ is called God, that's, that's seen as evidence that God, that Christ uh, has the same substance uh, as God. So I think Christ is there as, as part of the argument, but doesn't appear uh, in the, in the uh, published version of the text uh, directly. So uh, thank you gentlemen for those uh, comments. We're gonna take about a five minute break and regroup and we'll be more or less back on schedule by then.